Good afternoon, everybody. As ICTUI president, the last president for that matter, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the tribunal. I would like to thank you all for joining us today for what promises to be a fascinating journey called From Start to Finish, narrated by two prominent registrars of the tribunal who have been exceptional at administering justice here at the ICTY. The purpose of this informal gathering is twofold. First, to provide you with a unique opportunity to hear from the first ICTY registrar, Theodore van Boven, and the last ICTY registrar, John Hocking, in the course of an open and frank conversation about how they got here, their personal experiences working at the tribunal, and their unique challenges within the ICTY registry during what have been tremendously challenging years. Second, to mark the commemoration of the 24th anniversary of the ICTY, because it was uh, exactly in this month, the month of May, way back in 1993, when it came into existence. Therefore, this is a timely event that honors the legacy of our tribunal. I would now like to share with you some personal remarks about my time here at the ICTY. My arrival at the tribunal was not only unexpected, but also until that point seemingly unthinkable to me, coming as I do from such a small island like mine. In the 90s, I was in Malta and had become a judge on the Constitutional Court and the Courts of Appeal. I was therefore very much absorbed by the domestic or Maltese uh, matters. But like everyone else around the world, I followed almost daily the tragic events that were unfolding in the former Yugoslavia. I could not believe that less than 50 years after Europe had endured the Holocaust, innocent civilians were being displaced and dehumanized and lives senselessly destroyed. When an opportunity arose for me to become a judge at the ICTY, I quickly accepted what I considered to be the chance of a lifetime. I was fascinated by the prospect of being part of a new and bold organization actively involved in the fulfillment and implementation of the great ideals and goals of international justice. After my election in March 2001, I moved to The Hague to take up my new position in November of that year. I must confess, this was the first time I had ever lived abroad, and certainly my impressions of this city have changed since then. The quiet and the calm environment, the cold, the rain, the wind and the absence of sun <laughs> initially had a major impact on me, not to mention the challenge of avoiding getting run over by a bike <laughs> and driving on the wrong side <laughs> of the road. Since then, I have grown to enjoy, even love, many aspects of living in The Hague. In the professional sphere, my impressions of being part of something very new and exciting deepened when I met my colleagues, all from different backgrounds and legal systems. Despite its challenges, it became evident that diversity makes us better. 
it was pleasantly surprising that in my very first trial, where I was presiding judge, that's in the Berjanin case, I was assigned together with two excellent female judges, Judge Taya from Japan and Judge Yano from the Czech Republic. Afterwards, I worked on numerous other cases, eventually presiding over a multi-accused case in Popovic et al., moving on from trials to the appeal chamber, serving as vice president, and chairing the rules committee for a long number of years. As you can see, I have had my fair share of opportunity and experience here at the tribunal, and I feel very privileged. That said, I would have never imagined when I joined this tribunal 16 years ago, first, that I would still be here today, and second, that I would end up being the person entrusted to close down this first international criminal tribunal of the modern age. This journey has been as rewarding as it has been challenging and demanding with the hardest part yet to come in the next six months. Before I finish, I would like to publicly commend the work of uh, Theodore van Boven and John Hawking and to congratulate them for their commitment towards ensuring that international justice and the rule of law are upheld and for the immeasurable contributions to the achievement of this tribunal. I also wish to acknowledge our distinguished moderator, Kate McIntosh, uh, ICTY's deputy registrar since 2012, who has brought to the tribunal wide-ranging experience in international criminal justice, human rights, and the humanitarian field. I wish to thank you all, and I now give the floor to Kate. Thank you very much, President. Welcome, everybody. Um, <clears throat> very happy that you could join us here today. And before I go on to introduce, well, they don't need much introduction, the stars of, uh, of, the, stars of the show this afternoon, um, I would just like to address what might be two questions uh, in your mind today. It occurred to me that some of you might be thinking, first of all, why? Why would we have the story of the ICTY? from the perspective of the registrar. And a few of you may even be wondering what? What does the registrar do? Or what is the registrar of the International Criminal Tribunal? And I think that's because the registrar of an international criminal court, which is now a well-established position, was actually invented here. I mean, I think when our first speaker started, there was no comparable position. There was no registrar, no similar registrar at Nuremberg, or Tokyo, there's no comparable position in national jurisdictions. So it really had to be made up. And we'll hear, I think, through this conversation, perhaps some answers both to why it's interesting to hear that story and, uh, and what that job really is about. So turning now to the two people either side of me, of course, you know that this is Professor Theo von Bova. You have his, uh, I think, abbreviated biography, uh, which is nonetheless pretty lengthy in the folder next to you. I won't go through it now, but of course, we have uh, Professor Van Bolver with us today because he was the first registrar here at the ICTY until 1994. And on my right, Registrar Hawking, uh, whose biography is also in the folder. Uh, now, John is not only the current registrar, he'll be the last registrar, and he will also be the longest serving registrar of the ICTY when we close down. So, Theo, if I may. You're sitting here, back in this building, for the first time in many years. How does it feel? I feel quite well, but I, I, I met some of the veterans also uh, of the days when I served here. It was only a short period, but it was so good uh, to, to be here in this building and, and, and knowing the commitment and of, of this new adventure, mm -hmm. which we're all... Uh, trying to uh, to come in and so uh, 
I'm happy that also uh, uh, there is a, a good attendance here who are interested in, in the work of the registry of the, of, of, of the, uh, of the tribunal. So, yeah. Uh, tell us about how you, how you actually came to get the job. Well, I must say that you are the first to ask me that question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, I did not apply for it. Mm -hmm. I did not apply. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in fact, um, uh, I think at that time um, the uh, Netherlands was interested to have, as, as the host state of the tribunal, was interested to have an, uh, someone, a Dutchman or Dutch woman here as the register. Um, that would not, as, in that period of setting it up, because there were many things to be arranged with the Netherlands uh, on, on such issues as, as security, mm -hmm. for which they had a, a great responsibility, on other issues from how are we going to convert uh, this building into a courthouse uh, and, and, and so on. So they had a certain interest at that time. I would not say that uh, therefore uh, a Dutchman or Dutch woman should be for all a register. <laughs> but, uh, so that was one. And on the other hand, I um, had a quite a long experience also uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I served in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs some 16, 17 years, from 1960 on. Uh, Saturday was still a working day in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, in, in, and um, so I knew the workings of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and of Justice. At the same time, I had an experience, and they thought that might qualify me, or in, in the United Nations. I was for five years uh, the head of the uh, Human Rights Center, or Human Rights Division, as it was called, of the United Nations. And so I had been dealing often, also, although we were based in Geneva, uh, I had been dealing with issues of staffing, uh, coordination, budget, uh, and, and so on, and planning. So they thought that I uh, as assembled some of the, uh, the capacities uh, that were needed for this function. And did you have any hesitation when you were offered the job? Well, yes, I had some hesitation okay. because I, at that time I, I was already a, a professor of law at the University of Maastricht. I served at that time also at UN uh, bodies as a special rapporteur and uh, and, as, and I thought that um, accepting this job I may have to give up other functions to which I was attached and uh, so I, I hesitated somehow and in fact my appointment I was uh, according to the books because uh, I was an acting Acting register, not not a full apparently not a full register. It was not a, not exactly a full time job, in at at the time, and uh, I stayed only for one year. But I can explain that later. Um, well, take us back to then the, the the very early days, because in my mind I have an image of you were effectively handed a Security Council resolution, and told to make it into reality. Yeah. I mean, it must have been hugely challenging. I mean, what, where did you start? What did you do? What were the obstacles facing you? <laughs> that, Take the picture for that's us. Another, us that's another good question, because um, I uh, was not working alone, of course. And I, I wanted to say that we had at that time, and I think also in later years, we had an, an excellent president. Uh, Antonio of Nino Cassese. Uh, he really was, in retrospect, also a blessing uh, for, for, for this tribunal. Uh, in fact, he was deeply committed to the cause. Uh, he was someone who would never give, give up. Uh, sometimes also, uh, he handled matters which did not necessarily belong to his normal duties such as finding a prosecutor because searching for a prosecutor because we had in those 
in that time, eight months with functioning without a prosecutor. And um, uh, he, uh, he was really, I think, they could not have had a better president at that time for, for those years. Sometimes I had also my, my quarrels with him because um, there, was, there were many things to do, and, but um, uh, he wanted to control also everything, whether a staff appointment should be made at P3 or P4 level, something like that. I, I had sometimes my differences of, of, of view with him, but um, uh, he was, I, I think, an old comrade in arms because I, I worked with him at, on human rights also in the United Nations and uh, I, I'm glad to be here to pay tribute uh, to, to his contribution in setting up uh, this, this because you asked me how can you work um, on, on a Security Council resolution? Well, this is not a one-man job for the register, but I think sometimes uh, Nino Cassese thought it was his main job. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, in, 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 and, but I was much assisted here uh, by uh, staff members because um, I, I was made the, the chair of a task force. So I, I would not do it all myself, but I was off relying, in fact, on the advice and on the input of many others. So that uh, my, my job was also more to uh, stimulate others and to work together than to try to find the outcome of what, what, what the tribunal should, should be. I'll tell you, some other, at least two of those staff are still here. David Falsies, who I think was here to meet you on your first day, and Janice Lumen Kearns, I know, is here. So some of the staff are still here today. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned uh, then President Cassese, but actually uh, John and I first met in, uh, in then Judge Cassese's right. office, right. I think, uh, back in 1998. But you, you were sitting on the floor, Kate. Apparently I was sitting on the floor. <laughs> Surrounded by books. Surrounded by books. <laughs> books and papers. But John, I wanted to ask you, maybe you could tell us about how you came uh, yeah. to the tribunal. Um, I think I'm lucky to be here because um, my, how I came to be here was that I got a phone call. I was sitting in my office in Sydney and it was a phone call from, the, from Queen Elizabeth's um, former representative in Australia, the, the Governor General, the former Governor General, Sir Ninian Stephen. Um, and I thought it was a hoax. I actually thought it was a prank call by a friend of mine. And I was about to say with a number of expletives, um, please, I've got work to do. Unfortunately, uh, there was a gravitas in his voice that held me back. And um, uh, it was to um, discuss with me a, a job as a legal officer in chambers that I had actually applied for a year ago and, of course, had completely forgotten about. Um, but. Uh, fortunately, I, I got the job. I was incredibly excited. I arrived at the ICTY in 1997, which was the first day of the Celebici trial. And the Celebici trial was the second trial of the ICTY. We'd had Tadic, a single accused. Celebici was four accused. It was the first multi-accused case at the ICTY. And it involved... Um, uh, crimes that were um, committed in the Celebici camp in central Bosnia for accused of crimes committed against Bosnian Serbs at that camp. Um, it was also a seminal judgment at the end because Celebici established that rape could be torture. Celebici was the first um, time that an international court pronounced on command responsibility since Nuremberg and Tokyo. So it was also an extremely important judgment in terms of the judicial findings. I went into the courtroom two hours after I started work here and I sat in front of the judges and I had sitting behind me, I had um, the Nigerian presiding judge, uh, a judge from Pakistan and a judge from Costa Rica. The prosecution, uh, the lead prosecutor was Swedish. Uh, he was backed up by an Italian prosecutor. The defence, the four defendants were in the back of the, of the room and we had defence counsel from Bosnia, from the UK, from the United States. I remember the 
Um, the English consul had complete with his wig on. The guy from Texas was literally wearing his Texas boots. And then we had, um, of course, the interpreter's booths, the cameras, etc. And I just was like, this is something I had never seen or experienced before. But also, within a matter of days, um, the prosecution witnesses started to appear. And very early on, one of the first witnesses was Grozdana Cechez. And um, she came, and I remember her testimony to, to today, and she came and she spoke to us about her three and a half months in the Celebici camp. And she spoke in intimate, with intimate details and about the pain, um, the suffering, and the rapes that she endured day after day and night after night during her three and a half months there. And I remember, and I remember um, at one point in her testimony, and she was talking about describing, as I say in, in detail, about the, the physical aspects of the rape, but also how it was making her feel. Um, and she said that she, she, she looked at this young man raping her and she said, you're a good friend of my son's. Um, I'm old enough to be your mother. Why are you doing this? Um, and so I realized not only was this an extraordinary environment, these were also completely out of the ordinary crimes and that what we'd seen as terms of images on the TV and what was happening in the former Yugoslavia was actually being told to us, told to us in the courtroom and told to the, to the world. And so I think there was a real feeling that maybe we can do something uh, here. Thank you. I mean, there were no trials going on while you were registrar, <clears throat> but pretty early on there was the arrest, the Tadic arrest in February 94, I think, in Germany. What did that mean for you as registrar? What, was the, what did you have to do with regard to that? How did that change your task force activity? Well, uh, Tadic, as, as he was indeed, he was probably not uh, a big fish, but he was uh, arrested and uh, prosecuted in, in Germany. And um, it was known that uh, if uh, the tribunal here would uh, request uh, his deferral, uh, that Germany would, would quite uh, be willing uh, to cooperate in that. In, in fact, also, that is the position of uh, the primacy of the tribunal over national courts. So the, there was an obligation to do so. And this was also uh, formulated already uh, in the uh, rules of procedure and evidence. But uh, in fact, um, uh, this, was, uh, this deferral request uh, was uh, treated here uh, for the tri uh, trial chamber. And uh, it was not a, a, a very controversial or difficult uh, case because it was known, as I said, that Germany uh, would be willing to cooperate and, and to make the tribunal, and that was important at that time, to make it visible. Uh, because a lot of work was done here behind the scenes, not necessarily by me, but, but by, by others, also in the prosecutor's office, uh, on, on investigation, on analyzing materials and therefore, but to, to, um, uh, to personalize it, uh, to, uh, to bring someone to trial was important, although uh, um, it was uh, in this whole uh, that uh, a sort of trial room, uh, courtroom was, was established. Now, uh, uh, were, you, were you ready? Were you ready from uh, the no, ministry's perspective? Not, not much. Yeah. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I, I wrote it down because I, I thought uh, it was criticized because for the first time uh, the judges were wearing their robes uh, and, and that was already something that, that was visible. And, 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 and so, but others thought that this was done not in a very uh, professional way here. We, we, we established a sort of, you know, I, I, I can't even say with, with all kinds of, of uh, colors of, of 
green or was it blue? In this, in this very space. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. And and but someone said, well, it looked like a sort of high school moot court uh, <laughs> per, per, uh, performance. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, but it it, um, it it was covered quite uh, extensively by the press, and finally. Uh, the, the, the public at large had the feeling it, it is moving now. But my role on that, I, I, have not, I did not play a specific role on, on how uh, this, uh, uh, this hall should be uh, uh, decorated or what, whatever. Uh, and, and what about Defence Council? The, well, uh, we had been working and, and that was one of the things that also in this task force was, was, was a subject of interest and the victims and witnesses unit. But defense council uh, was, uh, uh, was something that had for long been a, a neglected uh, issue. And uh, there were already uh, some lawyers who were coming to me and they said, well, um, can we be assigned to be a defense attorney? And there were already, we did prepare a number of rules. And um, so I, uh, uh, I said, of course, uh, that, that, that is possible under our, uh, our legal uh, directives and legal. But um, they asked me also what, what uh, in fact, uh, are the emoluments or the, the fees and, and, and so the, 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 what is the financial aspect of it? Now, I, I knew only that we had to be very modest as far and, and apparently uh, they asked what, what are uh, the, the uh, uh, fee for, for one or two hour service. I, I, I said I, I really don't know. I, I, so we were not prepared yet for answering that question. And so the whole uh, notion of the defense council, defense attorneys, was only developed a little later after I left. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, the, um, uh, in fact, also, some continental, European continental lawyers were also not familiar with the Anglo-Saxon practice of uh, judicial uh, uh, criminal trials. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think some of, uh, at, at the end of the day, um, it was um, Mr. Um, Vladimirov, a Dutch lawyer, uh, who uh, was assigned to be the defense counsel for Tadic. But apparently, he and also others, like, um, uh, like um, Frans Fons Ori, he was, Fons Ori was less paid than, uh, than Vladimirov because... Is he, still, is he still angry about that? Today? Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if he's here. It was le uh, anyway, they had to take briefings and training courses mm -hmm. to act also in, in the tradition of the common law uh, uh, judicial process. So, uh, but I don't know whether, whether the registry that happened after I left that the registry was also involved in, in organizing these training courses for continent, European continental lawyers. So that, but this opens up also an issue that was rather problematic for many lawyers, uh, that uh, the Anglo-Saxon common law tradition prevailed over the European continental uh, criminal tra tradition. But anyway, the Tadic case was only, uh, Tadic was then transferred uh, in, uh, in the course of 1995, and he was in fact also the first detainee in, in, the, in, the, in the prison. In the, the, yeah. yeah, well, I was Tension interested unit. to ask you about that, actually, but I, th I feel like you opened an obvious question for John when you talked about the defence structures and so on all being set up after you left. I mean, John, you, you saw a lot of that happen and, and you're yeah. managing it today. What, can no, you tell I, us a bit about the I evolution? Can, uh, I'm building on what Theo um, has said at the beginning and, and even when I arrived, I think there was a very 
A number of people had quite some mistrust towards the defence, um, some even accusing them of defending the indefensible, when of, of course we know they are just defending justice. But, um, and when I came in the early days, defence could not even get in the front door here unless they were escorted by security. They couldn't go to the library unless they were escorted by, the, uh, by security. And they certainly couldn't go up to the cafeteria. Um, and now, um, over the years, we've truly worked um, to integrate the defence both into the day-to-day -day life of, of the ICTY but also institutionally so that now defence, um, they can sit in the cafeteria and they have a seat, of course, on, on committees such as, as the Rules Committee of the ICTY. Um, and some of the major developments that we undertook that um, transformed the situation, the position of defence from those early days to where they are today, um, some of the key things that we did, one was to work with the defence to establish an association of defence councils, so like, a bit like a quasi bar association that was there to collectively represent the interests of defence. And the other was, and you talked, Teo, about how much were they going to get paid, um, the other was to develop a payment scheme, and, and we built on that and ultimately came up with a lump sum payment scheme um, that, gave the, that, that basically gave the authority as to how the money for the defence was going to be um, spent into the hands of the lead council. So this gave the defence much more flexibility. It showed that the institution had confidence and trust in the workings of its defence council. And it also removed a lot of the sort of bureaucratic steps involved in, in monitoring payments. So it was sufficient to satisfy the needs of the United Nations, um, but it also gave the flexibility uh, to the defence. And I think that model that we have built up has actually been um, followed on by a number of, um, of, our, of our colleague um, courts. Um, the idea of a bar association or an association of council, I think the ICC set up, established one um, last year. Um, and I know there was um, a, a group of, of defence council from some of the international courts um, in Nuremberg um, recently this year also establishing an association of defence councils. So again, I think many, uh, an enormous progress from, from those early days. If I can ask you to look back again from, now we know the story of the ICTY and what happened and we're heading towards its closure, but when you started, what were your expectations about how the institution would develop? I mean, did you feel it was going to work? Did you think it was going to be a success? Yes, I think we had here and, and personally also, we had a common feeling that we were working on a very important project. Mm -hmm. It was a new adventure. Uh, we were aware that a, a number of states also uh, were rather critical. Uh, and, and also in Europe, the, the European countries were quite divided. That is still not only a matter of the past, but still on, on certain issues also now. But. Um, uh, we were, we felt that um, the, the question of uh, 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 impunity, which had prevailed for so long in so many situations, that it was important now that the international community uh, 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 decided to take up uh, this issue uh, in, in, in regarding the Balkans. So that uh, and. There was also the notion among us uh, that, and I felt the same way, uh, but this perhaps was fake, that uh, the creation of the tribunal could have a very important preventive effect, uh, that it would deter that uh, these atrocities would repeat themselves. And in fact, we know that, uh, and uh, it was still a time that the hostilities were going on because uh, other tribunals like Nuremberg, Tokyo and so on were in fact victor's justice after the, uh, the war or the hostilities had ended. Now, um, it was only at the Dayton court that also an, a sort of um, s session of 
of uh, um, was reached of, 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 of war and hostilities. But um, when, it came, when it comes to the preventive effect, I'm sorry to say, for instance, that the drama and the, the, of, of, of Srebrenica occurred while this tribunal was already in function. So the, the, they did not prevent that from happening. Um, but uh, to take uh, international humanitarian law seriously and, uh, and so on, we, we were deeply committed to that. And, uh, and that was, uh, again, a common feeling. But um, there were states uh, that, uh, that were, were extremely uh, skeptical of, 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 of such, particularly what was uh, resented is of, by, by some, and that is still a, a, a difficulty in the United Nations going on, is that the role of the Security Council was, had, did the Security Council act uh, within the proper limits of its powers? Of limits to within its power, or um, uh, or what did it contribute to achieving peace and security? But I, I do think, but uh, that still now uh, we uh, the, the question of retributive justice is something important that we cannot close down the chapters of history. On, on the atrocities that uh, have been committed. And uh, I think that also the, the, this tribunal is playing a role in that respect. I'll come back to ask you yeah. for your evaluation actually <clears throat> later, but was that still the situation when you started, John, in terms of was there still some skepticism or was the tribunal really well established when you joined? Well, when I came in here in, in March 1997 and started working on the Celebici trial, we had, um, we had the Celebici, the, the arrests we had at, in our custody at the time, we had the four Celebici accused, the um, Tadic, Blaskic, uh, Ademovic, I think that's about seven accused. And I remember at the time um, that the, over much debate as to what was actually going to happen to the ICTY. Um, were we going to finish these, these seven cases and um, sort of finish as um, an interesting um, ideological um, experiment or was, were we really going to go ahead and, and, and fulfill the mandate and the ideas behind why we'd been set up? And things really, there was a, it was a turning point because in 1998 we started to get more arrests, and over the next three years or so, some 50 accused found their way to The Hague. And this was the real turning point, I think, in the life of the ICTY and its success. Um, and that, um, those arrests, those 50 or so arrests, which followed on um, very much down to the dogged determination of the prosecution and um, the uh, cooperation of, of member states and, and um, other orga and, and organizations. Were you ever involved in any arrests? Uh, no, the regist no, the registry is not involved in the arrests per se, um, but we would come in and get involved um, once it was a question of transfer of an arrested person to the ICTY. And particularly in my, um, when I moved across to become the deputy registrar and then, and then the registrar, um, I would often be one of the, the first people to meet um, accused as they were transferred to the ICTY. Uh, and on a number of occasions, I was um, literally the first face um, that a, an accused person would see um, from the ICTY when they landed here on the soil um, at the Netherlands. Um, the, the accused... Um, yeah, the, the accused, as they, as they came, um, had um, all different personalities. Um, some were um, particularly defiant that they had been held, um, captured by the ICTY. Um, others were um, remarkably calm, um, polite, um, dignified. Um, so we got a, a, a wide range of... Um, 
responses and, and reactions to those first moments um, at the, at, in tra transferring here um, in, in Holland. I remember um, one particular um, accused who we had been uh, looking for, chasing for many years, for a number of years. And um, as he, um, his plane, the, I, I was there as, as the plane door opened and the steps of, of his aeroplane came down and, and um, he walked down the steps and uh, I, I held up my hand, I introduced myself, we shook hands and he said to me, um, hello, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. So, uh, <laughs> you see, all sorts of responses, but I think from all sorts of um, personalities. But what I think was really marked was um, that across the board, I had the feeling there was a real negative expectation as to what would happen to the accused when they got here, what, the, what, would, what it would mean to be in the custody of the ICTY, and it was a very negative I, I, um, uh, expectation. And to the contrary, I think, um, across the board over time, as I met the accused and, and we spent, um, and I would meet them in detention or in the courtrooms, um, the one thing that was, was consistent was how that perception changed from negative to actually a very positive um, uh, view of the professionalism of the staff, um, all the staff, and in particular those who work in the United Nations Detention Unit and who have day-to-day -day responsibility for, for the accused. You didn't have any detainees, of course, but did you, you had to keep, you had to have something ready for a transfer. Yeah. You had to set yeah. up the detention yeah. unit somehow. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, was it, what was it like? How, did you have a functioning detention unit with no detainees? Or well, <laughs> that, that was somewhat a problem. The detention unit, of course, was provided for uh, largely by, by the Netherlands. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, 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 it a sort of special international uh, prison uh, was created within the wider context of of, of an, 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 a Netherlands uh, penal institution. Uh, in fact, um, we had to be ready, therefore, at, at within 24 hours when someone was supposed to come here and uh, and had to be arrested and detained. That uh, and the uh, detention facilities were open and available. So f for long, uh, we have been discussing also with the Netherlands uh, and, and again uh, the, the issue of budget plays a role uh, that um, how many units or should we create for, for detainees? And uh, now it was it turned out that um, you had a unit of 12 on the ground floor uh, and we thought, well, maybe we need more. And so uh, then we said, well, what about uh, having, uh, f building up from down to, uh, up to the highest floor, uh, two more floors for, for that, so 24 or 36. Now, the higher you get, the cheaper it was comparatively. So that was, that was attractive for the Netherlands. They are somewhat uh, econo economizing from time to time. But anyway, anyway, anyway the, the staff there felt uh, rather uh, 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 unequally treated because um, the regular staff, uh, for, for prison staff, uh, they are dealing with also extraordinary hours, night hour service, weekend service, and they are being extra paid for that. And this did not happen um, with the, uh, the, the, the one in, in charge of the UN detention unit. Because they didn't have anybody to look after. No, and, and, and exactly, exactly. So that these are the little little problems you are encountering. It is just, uh, uh, of course, I don't know how, uh, and John will, will know more about that. How it further developed, uh, um, but um, we also concluded at that time. Of course, the the, the, the UN detention unit was uh, rather guided also by UN prison rules, by UN standards, human rights standards in particular. 
and um, uh, the, 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 therefore also uh, special uh, in, in, at that time we concluded a, a letter of agreement with the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, that also they could have access and, and that would also be some outside control of the situation there. But uh, I have not been, uh, I must admit, I've been once there in, on the, in, in the Scheveningen prison grounds, but I have not a an, an very prominent role in, in, in creating this. Uh, this was largely done also by the, the Netherlands and in the context I had with the Netherlands. Yeah. And, and what about security at the time? Because, uh, the, as you mentioned, the tribunal was set up in the middle of the war. Yeah. And um, I know that we still can't open our windows in this building, for example. Uh, <clears throat> but what was the security environment? I mean, did, you were also responsible for security. Was it uh, considered to be high risk? Uh, were there rules, ways you had to behave? Or? Well, um, again, um, that was an issue in which the, the Netherlands was... was, was mm -hmm very much involved because they had also a great deal of responsibility for the security, not only security in relation to diplomatic missions here, other international organizations, but also for this. And, and as you said, uh, the hostilities were still going on. So uh, uh, we had discussions in, in our task force as well uh, about the um, uh, security measures to be taken. Uh, including uh, bulletproof uh, windows, bulletproof means of transportation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I, 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 I do remember that uh, certain uh, uh, high personalities of, 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 of the tribunal, like uh, President Cassese and also uh, the, the, the prosecutor Richard Goldstone, uh, they preferred much more to ride their bicycles than sit in a bulletproof car. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, and at the end, uh, they asked uh, uh, to uh, um, that uh, resources spent for such purposes that they could have a say in it. Um, in uh, Richard Goldstone's bicycle at, was at the courthouse was stolen there. So, <laughs> and, but, well, but um, uh, the security was, was certainly a, a matter of, of great concern because of, as, as I said, the, the hostilities were going on uh, in the Balkans and somehow demonstrations or other uh, incidents may occur also in, in, in this area. So we were very much aware of that. President Kassasi was still coming on his bike when I, when I was here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, John, maybe I won't ask you about detention in view of the time, but maybe it's, um, although I'm sure you'd have a lot to say about it, but um, it strikes me that it would be nice to hear about what this building was like when it was absolutely at its peak, because oh. now, of course, we're tailing off, oh. and we've heard about what it was like the very first hearing here, <laughs> but I think you were deputy registrar or registrar during the really peak years, which you were sort of alluding to with the number of arrests and yeah, so on. Can you yeah. give us an idea of what it was like here in those times? I mean, it was just a buzz of activity. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, I, was, I became the, the deputy registrar as the ICTY started to <coughs> reach its peak. Um, and it's, it's almost paradoxical that um, whilst we were um, moving up to our peak activity, we already had to start to think about our closure um, and completing our work because the ICTY, of course, was always meant to be a temporary institution. But we knew if we continued with one courtroom um, and now with all these accused arriving, um, we could have trials running on for decades. And, of course, this simply wasn't um, sustainable. It wasn't something that um, we needed to find a way to conduct our trials um, expeditiously um, and fairly, um, even though we had this really exponential increase in our workload. And so it was through that, through the peak activity, um, that our completion strategy was in fact born. And the completion strategy um, had two elements to it. One was, of course, the referral of cases 
to the courts in the former Yugoslavia, um, the lower and mid-level cases and the tribunal working with those courts um, to, to undertake that work. But the second element was the joinder of cases um, and the holding of um, much larger um, cases. So what we did, this of course impacted on the operations of the registry. Um, we had to increase our courtrooms from one to three. Um, we also had to then double our uh, sitting capacity. So we entered into um, split shifts. We would start in the morning at nine o'clock. We would have a turnaround over lunch and then we would continue to sit until seven o'clock at night. So every day we had 28 accused in court at our peak. And I remember I was the deputy registrar and I was sitting in my office um, by the north gate there and I would watch the blacked out vans of the Dutch transport police as they would just, like clockwork, come in every day um, with our accused, different accused, in and out to moving our accused between trial and the detention unit. So um, that was how we increased just the physical capacity. And by the way, I mean, it, it had impacts that we hadn't thought of. I mean, we would need about 50, there would be about 50 people sitting inside one of the courtrooms. Our biggest trial had seven accused with defence, prosecution, staff, obviously. Um, we had around 50 people. This impacted on the air conditioning within the courtroom. Um, within, um, when I was started here, uh, we would wheel in, everybody would wheel in these trolleys full of binders and the hundreds and thousands of pages of transcripts and exhibits that constitute our cases and we would literally sit in the courtroom surrounded by binders. We had to find a solution to this because we were literally drowning in paper and from that we came up with e-court um, which almost overnight saw us go from a drowning in paper to a paperless court. Electronic uh, court management Sorry, system. Sorry, the electronic court <laughs> management, where all of the documents would be visible no longer on paper, but electronically for everybody in the courtroom, including the exhibits. The witness would be able to even mark electronically on an exhibit, and that could then go into evidence. So that transformed our operations. Um, and we also um, needed to um, really develop our interpretation um, services um, to keep up with this vast array of work. And so that was at its peak, 28 accused coming in and out, you described 50 people in the courtroom and so on. What about now? I mean, from the registry perspective, as the registrar, how do you, how do you go about closing down an international tribunal? I mean, you described the completion strategy, which actually you know, meant more work. But now, obviously, we are looking at the, at the, to, towards the closure of the tribunal. Can you tell us a bit about that? I, I think this is another, um, it's, a, it's another great achievement of the ICTY and the staff of the ICTY, um, that at our busiest moment, as I said, we're looking towards what do we have to do to close? So not only do we have to finish our work, but we also have to um, all finish our jobs. And so um, the ICTY at its peak was about 1,300 staff. On the 31st of December, at midnight on the 31st of December this year, we will go down to zero. Um, so how did we get from there to here? Um, how did, what happened to all those 1,300 staff? Um, and it was the staff of the ICTY and, and, the, and the leadership, we came together um, and together we developed our downsizing strategy um, to determine how um, the staff would be let go. So we actually, the staff actually, um, not only undertook their work um, and they continued to remain focused on that work, but at the same time they uh, worked with us to develop what would ultimately be um, the termination of their jobs. Mm. Um, it's something I'm very proud of. Um, not a, it's been praised within the, the UN, the downsizing of the ICTY um, as best practice. And um, we haven't had a single challenge before the UN dispute tribunal on our downsizing. And perhaps I'd also like to say another, what, as we're talking about staffing, um, a great achievement also with the ICTY is that we have um, exceeded the Secretary General's um, goals on, on um, gender parity. 20 years ago, all three principals were women. 
Um, and today, some 60% of our professional and higher level staff are women. Um, we have um, appointed women to, recruited women to positions that were traditionally held by men, such as a commanding officer. Um, and um, our ICTY Chief of Security, who is the first and only uh, female Chief of Security ever in the history of the United Nations. So I think these are really great achievements as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we're coming to the end of our, um, of our time for the, for the questions from me. Anyway, I'll open it up to the audience in just in one minute. But um, you were, for most of the ICTY's life, you've been able to observe it from outside. And you've, of course, been involved in international criminal justice in other ways. You mentioned, I know you were the chair of the Dutch delegation to the Rome Conference, the International Criminal Court, and so on. How do you assess the work of the ICTY, actually, from your, from your outsider position this time? Just reflect on, on how, you would, how you see it. Well, um, I, I, I think that uh, the ICTY uh, has opened up uh, new avenues also. Uh, and, uh, in fact, um, you mentioned also the, the International Criminal Court uh, and the Statute of Rome in, in that respect. Uh, in fact, uh, a, a number of issues uh, uh, were uh, important for the Rome Conference, issues that were developed here. Uh, for instance, the case law on interpretation, uh, on rape as, as a form of torture, for instance, on, on, on the Genocide Convention, uh, and so on. So, uh, from the interpretation of international humanitarian law, I, I think uh, this uh, tribunal has made an enormous contribution to that. Uh, and uh, also on more practical matters uh, in, in the ICC, for instance, the question of the election of, of judges. Uh, the, there was some criticism from time to time how uh, uh, judges were elected here and they uh, wanted to improve that uh, as far as the uh, ICC is is concerned. Whether they succeeded in doing that, that, that that's another matter. Uh, another issue that I think, and that is, comes very close to my heart, is the question of the victims. Uh, in fact, uh, we have here, uh, and that was we, in that task force I mentioned, we, we had a lot of work being done, also by really uh, experts on, on victims and witnesses issues uh, to give uh, issues uh, the, the, the right protection to these persons. And uh, it was also at a certain moment uh, but uh, that uh, the president of, of, of this tribunal, uh, Judge Jordan from France, uh, that he proposed to the Security Council uh, that also the tribunal should make a contribution uh, along the lines of the parti civile procedure in the French law, that they should make a contribution for reparational justice. And, 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 and not only uh, retributive justice, but reparational justice to the victims. And there, I think that idea got uh, much more developed in the uh, International Criminal uh, Court. Uh, so, uh, I think um, also in history, uh, this uh, the contribution, and certainly there were also weak issues and mistakes made, but by and large, in an overall issue, I think that this, uh, this tribunal has made a very important contribution to the development of, of criminal law and also of international criminal law and also to uh, doing justice, not only in a retributive sense, but also in a reparational sense uh, for, for, the, for, for the victims. So that is uh, a short uh, assessment of mine for, for on, 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 the, on the role of this type of... Thank you. Thank you very much. John, maybe just the last few words from me. You already talked about a couple of things you're proud of, but I thought as you're the last registrar, what, what are you most proud of? The ICTY has shown that justice is achievable. Um, 
25 years ago, uh, political military leaders um, thought that some could commit atrocities and be out of the reach of the law. And we have shown today that that is not no longer the case. In 1993, the ICTY was a sort of a lost, lofty, perhaps utopian ideal in, in your time, um, Teo, when you first came on board. Um, and staff, um, people were attracted to the ICTY to come and work at the ICTY from all over the world. Um, some uh, gave up careers as rock bands, in rock bands. I know some left um, Buddhist monasteries. Um, it's an incredibly it's been an incredibly diverse team of, of people who've come to work at the ICTY, but I think um, they have all been motivated and driven by the same desire to see the ICTY succeed and to see that its mandate would be fulfilled. And if you look back over the last 24 years, 161 persons indicted, every single one accounted for. Over some 6,000 witnesses have come through, um, have walked through these doors, have told us of their experiences, of what they suffered during the wars that um, took place in the former Yugoslavia. Um, and this has had a, a pr profound impact. The ICTY has made that possible. When um, Teo and, and your, you know, the handful of people who were here to support you started, I don't think you'd ever known of a, a world where there was such a thing as an international criminal tribunal like this. We now have interns um, here today who have never known a world without an international tribunal, an international criminal tribunal. And I think this is um, the profound impact of the ICTY, that after the ICTY, there's no going back. Um, justice is demanded. It's demanded at the international level. It's de demanded at the um, individual level. And what brought us all here over these last 24 years um, has also informed the courts that have followed us. Um, and so whether it be domestic courts, traditional courts, um, hybrid courts, and of course international courts, um, this is to me the great legacy of the ICTY, this shift in accountability. Thank you very much. That sounds like the right note to close on. So. Professor Van Boven, John Hocking, thank you. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to, oh yes, would you like to say something else? To interrupt. Please do. Um, because, um, just very briefly, um, there's someone who can't be with us today. Um, someone who was my first special assistant, he headed the victims and witnesses section, um, he's now battling illness um, with the same courage that his... Um, the witnesses he supported did when they came to testify. I uh, just want to wish Gus all the best. Gus to whip. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Um, I want to open up the floor to questions. Um, please feel free. We've got some mics. Uh, just show your hand if you want to ask a question. Please feel free to ask as, you know, as big picture or as personal or as uh, curious, any questions that you want. I have assurances from both the registrar and the former registrar that they will do their best to answer anything. So, um, please go ahead. Thomas Fairfus, Journalist for Justice. Professor van Boven, you recalled how difficult it was for lawyers from continental Europe to adapt to Anglo-Saxon practice and procedure. Um, you haven't told us yet how it comes that the decision for common law procedure was taken in the first place, because the first president of the tribunal was from a civil law country, the first registrar, you are from a civil law country, 
the tribunal is situated in a civil law country. Mm. And last but not least, the suspects and very many witnesses mm. are from a continental European countries. And still, the common law procedure has been retained. How come that this decision was taken in the early days when you were here? Interesting uh, question. I, I uh, uh, guess of, I know, I, I do not only guess, but I know that uh, a lot of preparatory work for the legal basis of, of this institution was done in the United States. Uh, the United States was deeply interested in the creation of this tribunal. And, and uh, in fact, uh, I think when we look at the rules of evidence and procedure and evidence and other legal instruments that were developed, that if you analyze them, uh, the first drafts were not made here, but uh, already in, in, in the United States. And uh, what became the statute of this, uh, uh, of this tribunal was, I think, based on the studies uh, carried out uh, in the United States. So um, that, I think, explains. Uh, I, I, I know that uh, President Cassese, uh, uh, he, uh, well, he said that we have to live with that. Uh, uh, we have to live with that. It is already prepared. A lot of good work has been done uh, on, on that. And, and so uh, in, in short uh, span of time, for instance, these legal documents were adopted here by the, um, uh, by the, by the, by the judges. The role of the judges, therefore, is, is, is different than the, the, the judges uh, of, of in, 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 in that respect of the, of the uh, International Criminal Court because the, the assembly of states parties has much more influence on certain developments than uh, it was here in, in, the, uh, uh, in the, this tribunal. So that is somehow, there was the Anglo-Saxon influence in the preparatory stage which led uh, to the setting up of this tribunal was, was considerable. Thank and you. in fact, I may say so, that, but that is sort of, uh, I was once taken very much by surprise as registrar because at, 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 at one day, a wave of 20 American staff members moved in. <laughs> and, and, and most of them were uh, around the office of the prosecutor. And, but I have been uh, working, and, and also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was surprised because uh, their status was nothing. And, and they were not paid also. That was, was, uh, uh, that was the big influence of the United States at that time. I worked with them because I were, uh, they were very uh, capable and, and an experienced person. So the quality of, of these persons was, was excellent. And, and for instance, in my task force, uh, I worked also with them because on issues of victims and witnesses and so on, they had a, a good deal of experience and, uh, and knowledge. But uh, um, it was only after quite a while that these 20 American surprise staff members were regularized. That is, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm maybe a little bit frank about that, but that, that happened. Not sure that international criminal justice could expect that kind of gift uh, today. But uh, anyway, any, any more questions? Hi, thank you. Matthias Hellman from ICC, formerly ISTY. Uh, when I worked at the tribunal, one of the most striking features of the registry services for me was the services provided to witnesses, well, victims and witnesses, but both the witness protection as well as witness support, uh, which I think maybe even today isn't that well known. And I would be curious to hear from the two registrars how you've, it, has that changed over time or was it pretty much sort of put in place at the beginning? 
uh, as it existed as it exists today. So. Any thoughts on that would be uh, appreciated. Thank you. Uh, I tell you, I mean, it was already in the rules, obviously, when, uh, or it was put in the rules. I think the existence of a victims of witness section already in 94, um, you, you, I think you mentioned that you were addressing that in the task force. Is that right? Yes, mm -hmm. we were drawing up uh, the, the, the applicable rules for that mm -hmm. and where the notion of protection uh, was taken very seriously. The, the, so the... Uh, the, the, how it further developed, that uh, I don't know uh, exactly. That perhaps uh, John, John could tell that. Uh, thank you. It's a really, really important question. Um, and the role of, of, of witnesses, of course, is, is fundamental to, to fair trial and justice. If I go back to what Kate said at the, in her introdu introduction about the registry um, not having um, an equivalent within um, uh, domestic settings, the same applies to, to the witness operations. Um, in, in a domestic setting, usually if someone needs to, is to testify in court, they'll, um, they'll either they'll make their own way there, they'll, they'll get on a tram, they'll, they'll get a taxi, um, they'll find their way to, to appear. Here, of course, it is a completely different operation and we realised very early on that what was required in terms of witnesses and um, victims uh, was a specialised operation. It basically had three components to it. Um, there was the protection component, um, because, of course, uh, some of our witnesses, um, by testifying, put their, their lives or, or the lives of um, those close to them at risk, and we needed to make sure that they were appropriately protected. There was the support component, because um, many, uh, if not the vast majority, of our witnesses um, who have come here have, um, uh, are victim witnesses and have um, suffered profound and um, deeply traumatising events which they come to testify about and we do not want that they, um, the, the, the act of testifying would um, cause some uh, re-traumatisation. So we have a whole team of, of specialists to, to literally to, to, to guide and hold the hands, provide support to, to those witnesses. And the third is the operations component because we had to get witnesses a lot of the time from very small villages within the former Yugoslavia, they would have to come with at least two planes to get here with a stop um, somewhere um, along the way. Many of them had never even been on planes, did not have, let alone have passports. And so we needed to help them and that was the operations. And I remember, and, and so that from that we developed this very specialised, unique um, section for providing witness support and protection, which I think um, has been followed by, by, by the other international courts. And just one final point, I remember when I talked about at the peak of our activities and the 28 accused and the, the Dutch vans, I also remember the operations room in the victims and witness um, section. It was a big open space area and there were lots of staff there and they had this massive whiteboard with all the names and, well, all the pseudonyms of witnesses because, of course, often they had to come in. They couldn't be in the same, some couldn't be in the same hotel together. Some would leave early, um, some would stay on longer. So it was a massive operation and it was, a, it was a hive of activity in those days. Thank you. In that case, I have the uh, good, the good news is <clears throat> I think we can move on from here to uh, some drinks and snacks when you'll have the opportunity to ask what you really want to know in a more private conversation with one of our two registrars. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very, very much, <laughs> Professor Theodore van Boven and uh, Registrar John Hocking. Thank you. <laughs>